This is Viticulture, where we share conversations with makers, growers, thinkers, and doers, folks who cultivate a good life. My name is Chris Missing, and I'm a lawyer turned winemaker in the Finger Lakes region of New York State, and I'm sitting down with great people in wine and other walks of life to hear their stories, learn their lessons, and take their advice on the perfect pairing. Today I'm speaking with Phil Plummer, winemaker for the Finger Lakes brands Montezuma, Idle Ridge, and Fossen View. We explore Phil's background, beginning with the experience he had at Rochester Institute of Technology that led him to pursue a career in wine. As we follow his journey from cellar rat to head winemaker, producing many different styles of wine. Despite a very large portfolio of wines he's responsible for, Phil's been combining experiments with new equipment and very traditional techniques alike and offers an interesting take on what the life of a winemaker is all about. If you like this podcast, please be sure to rate us five stars in Apple Podcasts and like our videos on YouTube. It really helps with the ratings and in introducing new folks to the show. Don't forget to visit our website at viticulturepodcast.com and please subscribe to our Substack, where you'll get show notes, transcripts, musings, and exclusive offers. We increasingly center our content around Substack's distribution channel, and subscribers will have the chance to hear some exclusive podcasts delivered right to your inbox. You can also support the show at Substack and help us keep producing high-quality, in-depth content with makers and producers of all sorts. Be sure to check us out on all the major social media platforms, and if you or a maker you know is interested in being on the show in the future, drop us a line at viticulturepodcast at gmail.com. And now... Here's the show. Hi, and welcome to Viticulture, where we discuss how to live a good life. Today, we're sitting down with Phil Plummer, who actually crafts wines for three brands in the Finger Lakes, Montezuma, Idle Ridge, and Fossen View each with their own special take. I have to tell you, I have become a huge fan of Phil's wines. He flies a little bit under the radar, but consumers and wine writers are starting to see they need to pay a lot more attention to this great mind. So Phil, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks, Chris. Thanks for the kind words. I'm really excited to be here. Well, thanks. Uh, So we were together about two weeks ago, uh, our mutual friend, mentor and really towering finger figure in the Finger Lakes, uh, Steve DeFrancesco, who'd been winemaker at Glenora for decades, retired. And I looked around that room and it was a mix of some younger folks, some older folks, uh, but it really, I'll be honest, it felt like the baton was being passed to the younger generation. Uh, so we are looking at an era of the Finger Lakes where it's kind of, it is coming into this new generation, this new life, these new ideas, and you are a core part of that, if you ask me. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. And just to recap a little bit, you got to know Steve all the way back in the day. Uh, I first met Steve in 2008, fall of 2008. Um, so a little bit about my background, I went to RIT in yeah. Rochester and um, started taking wine classes with Lorraine Hems because it was GPA buffer and, and at the time you could drink underage <laughs> under the guise of tasting. Um, so at 18, as soon as I could sneak into one of those classes, I started and that's where my love affair with wine started. Yeah. So it was a, a, a totally happy accident and um, I, I was taking a course with Lorraine in 2008 where, where it was field trip based and, and we uh, took a drive out to Glenora during harvest and, and that's when I first met Steve and, and he's been kind of a pivotal figure in my career ever since that first meeting. So what led you to go to RIT and where were you from originally? So I'm originally from Pittsburgh, okay. um, but my dad is originally from Horsehead. So the okay. Finger Lakes has been second home ever since I can remember. Yeah. Um, but I went to RIT for a really specialized program. As a high school student, I was very into computers and I was very into wet lab biology. And mm. RIT was one of like a handful of schools in the country that had a bioinformatics major. Oh, wow. Where, where you kind of connect the dots between those two. And, and that's, that's how I ended up there. Um, 
and I got about three years deep before I realized I was going to land behind a lab bench or a computer screen, and it terrified me. <laughs> um, so I was kind of listless for a while, and, and, and wine was something that I found in the midst of that, and I started... Um, I had like a clandestine brewery winery in my college apartment and started making my own stuff. And, and it was always like the, the Powerball dream, right? Someday, if I've got enough money that I don't have to think about money anymore, a winery is how I'm going to spend it. And um, Lorraine actually helped me get a summer job at Casa Larga that turned into a, a year-long part-time thing. And that's where it, it dawned on me that, that you could get paid to do this <laughs> thing that I really love to do for a living. So um, I just change gears and and luckily RIT is very very open to people who want to build their own program mm -hmm. so they've got this whole school of individualized study where if you get to RIT and and find something that you love and they don't offer it they're going to figure out how to make you how to put that program together for you and get you out of there with a degree so huh. um, I was able to do that there and uh, I've been in the wine industry ever, ever since that's neat. Casa Larga is a great place to get a start. You know, for one, especially going to RIT, it's not too far. It's up there in what Parrington, yeah. airport area. Yeah. Um, they're they've got some great old vines there now, uh, and they were helpful for us because when we first got started, um, we didn't have a press, and so that's wow. We bought one of their older presses and used that for uh, for five vintages. So uh, they have a special place in my heart, and the team up there is great. Well, and they're. There's such a good story too. I mean, um, it, it's been a long time, but but one of my roles there is that I, I worked in the tasting room sometimes, and I would have to give tours, so I got to learn the whole family story. And um, Andrew Colarotolo, the founder of of that company, he is like the American dream <laughs> story. I mean, he came over from Italy after the Second World War, didn't speak English, was um, working in construction, and managed to to get a degree in architecture, also an RIT guy. Huh. Um, and, and this was just his passion project on the side. I, I think that family built most of Fairport. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of the housing developments over there are, are theirs. So uh, this is somebody that came with with basically nothing and, and was able to build toward exactly what he wanted. I was in one of those houses last summer uh, for a nice backyard barbecue. And, I mean, what a cool setup because a lot of the backyards abut the vineyard. And so they're really living this, like, wine country life in the suburbs of Rochester. Can't have a propane can in there. <laughs> no. Yeah. Can't, can't. How do you keep the birds away? I, don't, I think they had um, – so when I was there, they had this, this sound system that played bird distress calls. And I think it was worse than a propane cannon. <laughs> honestly. Um, but yeah, I don't know what they're doing now. Um, it seems like, it seems like the, the technology for that is evolving. We actually have a grower that we work with at Montezuma now that, that has, a um, a laser mm -hmm. in his vineyard that actually has two now. Um, I had those debuted for me, um, two years ago and it's amazing. It, it basically just creates this laser grid. The birds see it. They don't want to go near it. Um, no, chemicals no loud bangs uh, the lasers run on batteries and solar power panels yeah. you know <laughs> i mean it's really cool yeah you just got to turn it off before you go into the vineyard to take samples and then you're good yep yep so montezuma there's a pretty neat history behind that brand as well um when did you start there and what has kind of been your career arc what's the story so once i got out of rit i um this is backtracking just a little bit um i i ended up um, getting a, a harvest internship over in, in Skinny Atlas that was like mm -hmm. my first real job out of college, and, and I was not ready for that. Um, I wasn't a good fit for them. They weren't a great fit for me, but um, I learned a lot there. I learned a lot of like just kind of standing on my own, right? Yeah. There was a lot of work to do, and, and it had to get done, and, and sometimes that meant it was just on me. Um, but I was very lucky that Rob Thomas of Shalestone Vineyards was the consultant there yeah. at the time I was. Um, and I learned a lot of really good stuff from him. Mostly I learned just to, to relax and, <laughs> and, and take things one, one step at a time. Um, and, and when that ended, I was in a position where I didn't know what was next. Um, I, I had a lease on an apartment in Auburn, New York and, and, uh, 
I knew I wanted to stay around. I knew I wanted to be in the wine industry. And I had a deep sense that, that if I, I left and, and went back home, this was not going to happen or, yeah. or, or I would lose some momentum and it would make it more difficult for me. So, um, for a while, I just kind of drove all through the Finger Lakes, handing out resumes to anybody who would, who would take one. Um, and I walked into to Montezuma Winery one day and, and uh, spoke with a few of the owners in, in the 10 minutes I was there. And, and in a few weeks, I came in and interviewed, and, and I've been there for almost 12 years now. Wow. Um, so it's been a, a great place for me to land. And, and they're very open-minded about wine there. The, the Martin family that started Montezuma um, came into the business from a bit different angle than I think most people do. Um, they were commercial beekeepers. They were trucking hives all up and down the, the East Coast doing a commercial pollination business. Huh. And, and honey was the side product that they would sell. Um, and, and they decided to get into meads back in 1998 hmm. and, and moved to Montezuma from Sterling um, in 2001 and, and they've been there ever since. So we we're celebrating our 20th anniversary as Montezuma winery this year. Um, but in the time since I've been there, we started Idle Ridge on Seneca Lake back in 2013. Um, and then we, we rebranded the next door neighbor as Fossum View, um, back in 2018. Uh, Idle Ridge. So I've never asked, but I kind of figured this out on my own. Uh, clearly not genius level stuff, but is it Idle Ridge because it's in the town of Lodi? So it's spelled backwards. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, it was when when they bought that property, um, it was just a field. Yeah, and, I remember. And uh, for a while, it was kind of a back and forth about what are we going to call this? And uh, we had a lady that worked in the tasting room that, that said well, why don't we do, do this? And, and mm. it, it stuck. Yeah. Um, and, and it's who we are now. It is a beautiful building and it's got a beautiful, beautiful vista that it looks out upon. My only regret is that, uh, Suzanne's, which was this amazing, uh, farm to table restaurant, not even a mile away has closed. That's the only bad thing about that location. <laughs> so it's not even, not even a mile away. It's right next door. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and, and I agree with you that Suzanne's was incredible and, and I miss it. Um, it. It was one of these restaurants um, that you don't find in urban areas because the folks lived there during the week and then arranged a bunch of tables in their living rooms uh, and, and kind of had converted their kitchen and then really did uh, farm to table. Everything was basically grown on site or sourced from nearby farms and the food was amazing. So if you're a restaurateur listening, that opportunity has reopened and we are desperate for you to come up here. Absolutely. It just, I think probably top 10 meals of my life. Yeah. I would put two of them there. I, I, in fact, I think I'd seen that in several magazine articles that it was among top 10 restaurants in the world. Um, so a little gem that's gone, but at least the wines remain. So absolutely. So, you know, I want to get into some specific wines. I want to talk about some unique winemaking practices you're taking. But let's take that 30,000 foot view because uh, you're you're making more wines than almost anyone I know. The the portfolio for um, for Montezuma itself is huge because you don't just make wines from grapes, um, but from honey and fruit. You name it. I mean, you have to have a big skill set for that. Yeah, it's a it's a different animal when you change up the materials. Yeah. It's, um, and it was difficult to learn at first because I, I think if you come into this starting with grape wines, which I think most of us do, mm -hmm. um, we get accustomed to to knowing where to ask the questions when it's time that we run into trouble. And yeah. you know, you can call Scott Labs or you can call Lafort or or you can call the team at Cornell, which I, I think they they've incorporate a lot more over the years um but early on it was like nobody had answers when when you're dealing with with a fruit like maybe cranberries right mm -hmm. where it's almost entirely pectin and there the ph when it comes in is like 2.5 <laughs> ta is somewhere around 30 grams per liter and it's like i can't th get this to go through a filter yeah. so what 
what do I do? And, and, and nobody has the answers. So you got to figure it out yourself. And, and usually the juice industry is, yeah. is, is where the answers live. But it, it was very important for me, I think, because it's a whole new layer of problem solving. Yeah. So, so actually I have no idea. What do you do? <laughs> um, there, there are enzymes that you can use that, that, are optimized to work at low pH. Okay. You can't buy them from any of the, the wine catalogs. Yeah. Um, but if you talk to people in the juice industry, they can put you onto some stuff that, that really works well. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just a totally different, different frame of mind and everything's different. Like, like you would go with something like cranberry where there's too much acid and then you snap into honey where, where the TA when you start is somewhere around two. Yeah. So it's like, it's a totally different set of challenges every day. Well, and not only that, but just in this general conversation of acid, like the reason why grapes are such sort of this magical fruit is how much tartaric acid they hold. Uh, And that's what can really support, you know, making great wines. Sure. There isn't tartaric acid in most of these fruits. And you can't add it. Huh. It's, uh... When you work in fruit wines, it's got to be whatever the predominant acid in that fruit is. So we're using lots of citric and malic. Interesting. Interesting. Um, as, now, as, as beekeepers, they didn't necessarily have their own farmlands, did they? No. So like a lot of commercial beekeepers, um, what they do is commercial pollination. So mm-hmm. if you go up to Lake Ontario, like in the early spring when the apples are blossoming, you'll yep. see all these beehives. Yeah out in the fields and and those are from commercial beekeepers that they've been paid just to leave their bees there and they pollinate the apples and then when the apples are pollinated they take their bees somewhere else where they're needed so like blueberries are are, uh, a big pollination crop on the east coast Um, orange orange groves in in florida are are a very big deal for east coast um, beekeepers if you go out to california almond groves are like the big game uh, if you run a commercial beekeeping business. So it's it's something where you're constantly on the road. And I think that's part of what prompted them to, to decide to, to settle back down. Hmm. Um, they were originally from Sterling, New York. Yeah. So they were able to, to kind of build out there. And then once their, their meadery took off and they started to incorporate some fruit wines, um, the property in Montezuma became available and, and they pushed into the Finger Lakes. Interesting. Did they ever mention anything about colony collapse with any of their bees? Because this was something that was talked about for for many years in kind of the mid 2010s. I haven't heard as much of it recently, but so it was something that that I think like there started to be an inkling that there was a problem about when they were getting out of that part of hmm. the business. Um, and there's so many so many theories about yeah. what what causes it and 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 um, how to fight it but i don't know that there's a real answer just yet no but it's intimidating when you realize that without bees there is no food or a heck of a lot less food you know and and how much we're reliant on uh the ecosystem in general but these little workhorse you know bees on top of it well it's a reminder that that at the end of the day mother nature is the boss like (laughs) And I think you see these clever little evolutionary hacks all through our business, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like at the end of the day, vinifera, vinifera grapes aren't for people. They're for birds. <laughs> I mean, walk out into one of these vineyards in, in the next couple of weeks and you'll see everything turn color. And it, that means the seeds are almost ready. Yep. Like, it's just all of the things that we look at it as, as great great aspects to to the fruit that we're working with like none of that's for us no and and to think about this that for the first eons of their existence there were no white grapes like that's just a gene that flipped off you know our whole industry is largely in the finger lakes based on fine white wine sure and to think like this was just uh, a hack of nature you know and and who knows exactly why maybe it was a survival mechanism for those you know, grapes to to not get eaten too early or too fast, I mean, who knows? But it's unbelievable to think about. Yeah, it's uh, it's wild. Like 
and, and I think it's it's very easy to get into a pattern of, of thinking that these are like all really great elegant solutions, but it's only because we don't see the the missteps, yeah. right? Like like evolution is messy and it's random and it's it's something where where yeah we see the the success stories, but but there's so many failures before that happens, and I think that's a an important lesson that you can take into everything like nobody sees the screw-ups yep no and actually talking about that no one sees the hard work and the misfires you know I, I'm, I was compelled to think um, I, I think of you as successful now and I think the success is only going to continue to grow Phil appreciate but, that um, but it took driving probably hundreds of miles and knocking on dozens and dozens of doors uh, to find that opportunity. And, you know, I spoke with Alex Robb. It was the same thing. When you find people who are really hitting their stride, it doesn't just happen. It, there's a lot of work behind that. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think it's, I think that, that this business in particular, uh, sorts for tenacity, mm -hmm. right? Like, like everybody wants to be a winemaker until they find out what being a winemaker is about. <laughs> Yeah. And um, and I think there are certain people that find out what it's about and that's all they want to do. Yeah. And and those are the people that you see year after year. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of people that, that it just doesn't pan out and that's fine. Yeah. Um, it's a conversation that I have anytime we hire somebody in the cellar that's aspiring to, to make wine. Yeah. It's like this is probably not the job that you think it is. And and I'm not going to make it any harder for you than it has to be. But if at any point you decide this isn't for you, just let me know. It's cool. Yep. I'm reminded of uh, just earlier this week on Monday, meeting with a grower that came over towards the end of the day. And we sat in our patio and had some wine and talked about grapes. And uh, some customers commented, like, oh, you live the life. And I said, do you know the last time I sat down with a glass of wine on this patio? Like probably last year talking with the same grower about getting some grapes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, I, I think this quote is, I don't know if for sure it can be attributed to him. Cause I think sometimes it's been misattributed. Um, but I've always heard this as coming from Charles Bukowski, who was, I mean, he was out there. Yeah, he was. Um, but he, he said, find what you love and let it destroy you. Yeah. And, and I think that's what it takes sometimes mm -hmm. to, to gain steam in, in this business or, or really any passion pursuit. Yeah. Well, certainly by the end of October, most of us feel destroyed. Exactly. So, um, so Montezuma, is it sourcing fruit? Is it growing any fruit? We don't grow a thing. Okay. Um, so we're sourcing from from all over the place um we've got uh we're a farm winery, winery license still i think there's some beehives out back that allow that to happen yeah. um but we're we're really just working with with growers um some of them are attached to wineries some of them are not attached to wineries um and, and we're we're very experimental so if you're new coming onto the scene and and need somewhere for your fruit to be uh we'll we'll listen you'll take we'll come visit <laughs> take a look at it yeah absolutely because um, that was the first thing that struck me so i'm looking you know through the portfolio and i mean it ranges from obviously your standard rieslings uh separavi a uh, number of different hybrids so this is a collection from primarily finger lakes fruit then primarily we do um Historically, we've worked with some farms up on Lake Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're kind of backing off of that now. Mm -hmm. um, we had one farm that we worked with for for six or seven years that, that they decided that they didn't want to grow grapes anymore, mm -hmm. um, that it was comparatively difficult to, to the apples that they built their family business on. So um, those vines don't exist, and we're, we're very sad about that. Um, but we've had some other growers up there that do a really good job. I, I just think... Uh, for purely selfish reasons, yeah. uh, it's a 45 minute drive in the wrong direction from all the other farms that we're dealing with. And and if I'm out there once a week during harvest, that's, that's, uh, a, a, a little bit exhausting. Yeah. Um, and, and there's value to that Finger Lakes Appalachian. Yeah. I think when consumers see that, um, 
they understand what they're getting and um maybe in a few years the that lake ontario area will will have built built that reputation as well it's interesting because clark smith of postmodern winemaking was here him. yeah he's an interesting guy huh he he's become a friend of mine oh good yeah good. he um so clark and i met at eastern wine expo in march of 2020 before the world stopped like literally four days before a global pandemic was declared um and then he and i got to talking and we really hit it off and um and i send him wines and he just brutalizes them (laughs) um but he's been pioneering a technology uh with richard smart and della tofola the uh it's a maceration accelerator so Mm -hmm. like the idea is that that when you crush your grapes you're basically just popping them so you have one one cut edge that you can get extraction so they've developed a device that that um actually chops the grape skins Hmm. so it puts a bunch of asymmetric nicks to speed extraction Hmm. um and clark drove one of those up and down the east coast last fall and stopped with us for a couple days and uh we ended up buying one so so that seems like it would be particularly useful in red fermentations because you want to get as much of that pre-maceration color, those anthocyanins, as possible. And you also want to make sure you're locking that color in as temperature increases on the ferment. Sure. Um, how, what, so you, the results have been good? Oh, oh it's stark, the difference. Mm. Um, and we actually put some Riesling through it, too. Interesting. So uh, I think for floral varieties where you're traditionally doing a cold soak, maybe yeah. we can cut cut some time out of that process um so i can't wait to see or taste some of those wines yeah absolutely and and we're going to be running it this fall so so we'll invite you up when when it's rolling if you've got some time maybe we'll do a viticulture field trip please do <laughs> please do and, and i'm i apologize i cut you off there no I that's just had fine a good clark smith story that i had to get out i love it so well he was here a couple of years ago doing a seminar and uh he said in in his book the only other place that he would want to see Pinot Noir grown outside of Burgundy was on the shores of Lake Ontario. That kind of stretch from, you know, think Buffalo to the west side of Rochester. Uh, I've had that tucked away in my mind for a while because that could be a pretty cool project. Yeah, I think they, they deal with some different challenges up there. Um, totally different soil types mm-hmm. and, and and I couldn't pin down exactly what they are, but I know historically um, vigor is an issue. Mm-hmm. Like, like there's a lot of management that has to be done to, to, to keep vegetative growth in check. Um, and, and they usually hold a bit more crop than, than vines that we'd see in the Finger Lakes. So it's, I think right now, a lot of the farms up there, grapes aren't their only, yeah only fruit that they're working with so so they're trying to they they have to kind of figure out how to fit it in and and what that means most of these people are growing fruit for the table yeah so there's a different approach to that where where you want yield and you want cleanliness and and these are great things but but not always great in the context of 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 winemaking um that's not to say that they can't be it's just like it's a totally different mindset that that's growing up around there. But I think, I think those farms are really special and and I think the growers up there are really clever and they'll figure it out. Well, yeah. And when you taste wines from like Leonard Oaks or from Arrowhead Springs, especially their Pinots, uh, they're in that belt that Clark Smith describes. And I, I think that those Pinots from Arrowhead Springs are about the most convincing in the state of New York. Yeah. I, and I think, um, I mean, you know, him. Daniel down oh, yeah. at Scout, he's yep. got some some Pinot Noir from that area, yep. and and boy, those are just so tasty. And that's where I, I originally was tasting the fruit because I, I tasted the Arrowhead Spring wines for years, and uh, it was the first time ever just popping those grapes in my mouth. I was like, oh my gosh! Yeah, I think they can do some tremendous things with with Riesling up there. Yep, um, Chardonnays, like there's there's a really high ceiling for that area. Yeah. Um, but I think they're in a stage where they're still trying to figure out, like, what do we do and what does does being from this stretch mean? Yep. Um, 
most of the farms that we were working with were in the Sodus Bay area. Okay. So so that's even a little further east than than where you're talking about, but I, I think they'll get it. I yeah. just it, it's a a learning curve right now. Yep. So yeah, let's bring it back home. <laughs> um, before we push the record button, we were talking about how we we both share this similar idea of there is a textbook on how to make wine. And it prescribes to do this, to add sulfur here. Uh, and how if you're simply a winemaker following the textbook, the wines will be clean, but they'll often be soulless. And I found that increasingly a lot of the wines you're making, like that's the best way to describe it. Like there is, there is soul there. Um, there is thought behind that. So, Well, I think um, I hit a stretch probably somewhere in, in – 2014 2015 where i had been at montezuma for for four or five years and i had seen a, a few harvests and i was drinking the wines that i was making and they were by the book wines and, mm-hmm. and and there was a disconnect between what i was making and what was getting me really excited yeah um and one of i think the common denominator there was me right <laughs> i was getting in the way um so this is a, a situation where I was very fortunate to work for the people who I work for because yeah. they're very open-minded and um, kind of let me have a few pet projects every year where it's just see what happens. And, and um, I'm going to say this, and, and it's going to sound bad, but um, we do uh, – the I say this as lovingly as I can. We do a lot of, of products where they're a little bit sweeter, they're volume products – and um, as a young winemaker, those are great places to bury the bodies, hmm. right? So, like, if I take a chance with with some some noire from Sodus and do something weird with it, yeah, and, and I have two hundred gallons of something undrinkable, um, <laughs> if it ends up in five thousand gallons of Concord, nobody will ever know about no. it. And and. Um, Part of it is, I mean, the flavors of those fruit wines and some of the native and the Labrusca, those flavors are so dominant. Sure. And the sugar sort of acts as this buffer from really sensorially finding anything else in there. Right. And and, and I know that that sounds bad because it's like, it it's maybe could be taken as like denigrating those products. But at the end of the day, those are what keeps roofs over all of our heads and, yeah. and keeps the lights on. So... I don't mean that to be uh, uh, cast in a negative light, but I, I really started to try and take chances. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think I learned for 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 four or five years how long my leash was, um, mm. so I wasn't living on the end of it as much as I am now. And uh, that's where we really started to get into things like pet gnats and um, and orange wines and things where where it was impossible for me to be in control. Yeah. I had to break that need to be right on top of things and, and sulfite goes in on this day and yeah. and this is the number I want to see here. Um, I had to remove that option from the table to really find out um, what we were capable of, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I think it kind of crystallized for me in 2018 because I, anybody that I talked to about the 2018 vintage – I just like crap all over it. Right. But I think, um, the way that I've, I've learned to think about winemaking is that like we're storytellers, right. Mm -hmm. And and by, by the nature of the stories we tell, we're going to be characters in them, Mm -hmm. uh, whether we like it or not. And, And, and part of where the real art comes in is learning where it's okay to be the main character Mm -hmm. and where it's not okay to be the main character. So like 2020, get out of the way. Yeah. Just like everything's perfect, just let it be what it wants to be. And 2018, boy, you have to intervene. Yeah, like that's like 2020 was a year where where you could kind of trip and fall into really good wine. Yeah. Um, without any action of your own, um, 2018 was a year where where that just that option wasn't on the table, yeah. and 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 you had to kind of. Uh, solve problems on the fly and deal with what you had. And, and and I think that was, that was the year where it came together for me that, okay, I know what I'm doing now. Right. (laughs) Like we're almost 10 years in and finally I know what I'm doing. Um, 
So I think that's been um, really valuable for me going forward from that point because it's like, no matter what I see, it's not going to be that bad, yeah. right? Like, like I can handle that. <laughs> it's interesting you talk about this transition between 2014 to 2018. It reminds me of my conversation with Paul Brock. And I brought up in that conversation how there was something in the air, I think, that circulated through a lot of us at the same time between 12 and 14, which was uh, if we are a maturing region, we need to take the fruit that we are growing very seriously uh, to another level. And that may not include us doing more. Oftentimes it requires us standing back and questioning when we should act. Um, and it sounds like you had that same sort of arc happening. Yeah. It's a, it's a conversation that you have with your materials. Right. So yeah. like, like I think when I was trying to get my feet under me, the conversation was always, how can I make you into what you, what I want you to be? Mm -hmm. And it shifted to like, what do you want to be and how do I get you there? Exactly. So I learned that with winemaking before I learned that with parenting and I'm in the midst of that right now, you know, where, uh, it, what it did to me was reinforce that like maybe this isn't some sort of universal law but it's a law that applies to some of the most personal and intimate relationships we have uh, that you cannot force things to be the way you want them to be there is a natural flow to what they should be right uh, and you have uh, the most important thing is to learn that and you learn it in the wine industry by working with the same fruit over and over and over for sure and, and, and I think you learn it too by learning to embrace some of the rough edges, yeah. right? Like, like I think that's, and, and, and there's a difference of opinion here and I don't, I, I'm, I'm not saying that, that I want to drink flawed wines. Yeah. Um, but I, I think sometimes we get lost in the weeds and, and we don't realize that like, there's a really fine line between flaws and beauty marks yep. and, and, um, wines are like people in that way, like. The, the ones that have flaws are, are sometimes the most interesting, and, and it's just when they become defined by those flaws that, that there's a problem. Yep. So when I opened up this show, one of the things I said I wanted to talk about was beauty and kind of an understanding of what beauty is. And when we talk about that, we're not just thinking about the, the beauty on a face, but I think it's pertinent because if you look at like some of the top models in the world, it isn't perfectly symmetrical. And maybe, you know, sounds strange to say, but like one eye is a little bigger than the other, or there is some small flaw that is almost humanizing, but kind of broadly, like, what do you think about beauty? Do you, and do you think that there is something universal to it or is it totally subjective based on the person? Oh, that's a great question. And, and this is something that I think is like, this is like one of the, the, the things that keeps me most excited about wine, right? Because yeah. like, like when we were talking earlier, I, I was telling you that I feel like you can have all these data points on wine and, mm -hmm. and we have a great lab at the winery and we can, we can check all these numbers and, and check all the boxes. But at the end of the day, it's the, the squishy stuff that lives in between those numbers that's yeah. really fascinating to me. And it's the stuff that I can't articulate, but I know it when I see it, yeah. right? Um, it's like, did you ever read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle oh, Maintenance? Of course, of course. The, the metaphysics of quality. Like, you can't put a definition to the idea of quality, but you know it when you see it. Yep. And, and I feel like that's maybe at the heart of what I'm trying to suss out every year yeah. when we get this fruit in. Is like, what does beauty look like in 2021? Yep. And, and, and maybe it's different than what it looked like in 2020. It's assuredly different than what it looked like in 2020. But it doesn't have any less value and it's a, a matter of maximizing what's there to achieve that goal rather than trying to say it's got to look like 2020. Yep. Yep. And that's the, I mean, that is one of the great things about the Finger Lakes, which can make it a challenge uh, when you're selling to people who are used to the same flavor profiles, vintage after vintage, but the vintage variation here makes for entirely different wines year after year from the same fruit. Um, let's talk about pet nat a little bit. So you make a number of different styles and just explain for, for the audience, like what is it and, and how do you make it? So, um, I think most people would be familiar with, with the sparkling wines that are done in the champagne tradition where, 
Um, you're making those like absent a, a few critical decisions. You're making those like you would make any other still wine. And then you put them through a process where you, you get them ready to be re-inoculated and you bottle them and, and they continue to ferment. You trap that CO2 and then you go through another whole process to get the, the yeast out of the bottles. Um, pet and at wines are like the quick and dirty cousin, <laughs> right? Where you're just bottling them before they finish primary fermentation, crossing your fingers and hoping it works out. Huh. And um, that can be... Uh, scary yeah um sometimes you learn things about those wines after they've been bottled that you didn't see when they were in the middle of fermentation um sometimes you learn that that they need to be disgorged um but it's it's an interesting process to see like what things can become if you just let them go and I probably skew way less on the nat end of pet nat. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a lot of people that are using um, indigenous yeasts to make that happen, but the nature of that process is such that you're bottling during harvest. Mm-hmm. And at an operation like ours, I, I can't wait around for for uh, uh, spontaneous fermentation to get into the right range and then switch gears and bottle. Yeah. Um, so I, I need to be on a schedule and and uh cultured yeasts put me on that schedule yeah. um they're they're predictable i know what to expect and and it's just a matter of of figuring out when things have coasted to to where we want them and and bottling them we use um ec 1118 yep. uh, because i can get it cold and it'll wake back up yeah. so it buys me a little bit of time to to get my ducks in a row for bottling and and we can we can go from there um but we do a range of, of pet nats. We do Riesling. We do. Uh, we've done Cab Franc Rosé. We've done Marquette. Um, one of our most successful was actually Diamond. Hmm. Um, and, and that's a throwback because that's what they would have been making a lot of the sparklings from back in the 1860s. Yeah, and and boy, if it doesn't make nice sparkling. Yeah. Like I, I think that that's that's become one of my personal like rabbit holes that I've fallen down recently is that like I think a lot of these heritage varieties have not been given their due Hmm. Um, and I think part of the reason that that happens is because they're usually the first things to to emerge in a wine region that's emerging right Mm -hmm. so like like hybrids and native grapes they go into the ground because they're relatively easy to grow Mm -hmm. and low input and, and and they're usually there before the expertise is and, and a lot of times you see them cast in these roles where it's, we can't grow cab, but we can grow chancellor. And, and here's what happens when you try and turn chancellor into cab. Yeah. Um, and then as soon as the, the viticulture and the winemaking catches up, the hybrids are just kind of chucked off to the side. And I think there's so much more to them than, than we're, we're willing to explore just because they're not the varieties that, that everybody knows. Exactly. So real quick on the production end, do you target 24 grams per liter before sending it to bottle, or do you want it to have a little bit less petulance? Uh, um, it depends. It yeah. depends. So, like, one of the things that we do is, is we actually way overshoot that sometimes um, because one of the things that I found anecdotally is that we can stop fermentations with pressure. Hmm. So if we have a year like 2018 where there's lots of acid mm-hmm. and we want to leave a little bit of residual sugar, we might bottle it at, at 50 hmm. just to, to ensure that we're going to have some sweetness hanging around. Yeah. Um, other stuff where, where we're comfortable with it going all the way dry, like we did, um, we do a product called String of Pearls for Idle Ridge, which is a, a, a pet gnat style Riesling. Mm-hmm. Um, and in 2020, we we stopped it right around 24 and and just let it finish in the bottle yeah um so it's it's one of those things where it depends on what we have that year and 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 where it feels like it needs to be it's uh i gotta be honest it feels so risky to send something to bottle with 50 grams of sugar you've got to be crossing your fingers like <laughs> yeah yeah as if it ferments i mean for those that don't know if it ferments You've got four gram for every four grams of residual sugar. You've got one theoretical bar of pressure. Those bottles are often rated to seven or eight bars. 
Uh, so it better stop fermenting because <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. That's what makes it exciting. Though, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, in my experience, when we, when we bottle things right up around 50, we, we usually end up somewhere around 25 grams per liter residual. Interesting. So it starts, I, I, I mean, I think it shuts itself off Yeah. right around that, that six bar neighborhood but that's a really nice profile for a sparkling riesling to have sure. that buffer of sugar playing with the co2 on the palate absolutely and and, and uh we did that with our diamond pet nat as well huh. and and boy if that <laughs> uh, i mean it's like a pineapple mimosa hold the juice oh nice nice now do you worry about cold stability at all yeah. <laughs> when it's time, I, I mean, uh, so with our string of pearls Riesling, that's always disgorged because gushing is a problem. Okay. Um, but typically when we're doing these, um, when it's time to stop them, I'll hold them for like a week, week and a half mm-hmm. at, at cold temp, somewhere around 35. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're dropping some, some tartrates there. Yep. Um, and it's also helping to settle those wines. So we're not getting as much sediment in the yep. bottle. I was going to say it, by doing that, and so first, and again, for anyone who doesn't know that tartaric crystals are, will fall out of suspension in cold temperatures, it, tartaric crystals also act as nucleation points for bubbles. And that's where you get that gushing, where you can, if there's a bunch of tartrates in a bottle of sparkling, you open, you're going to see a stream of bubble wine pop up. Yeah, three, three quarters of the bottle is going to end up on the ground. Yeah. Uh, but you're right, settling that way, that way you don't end up with too much yeast in the bottle and you will take care of a good number of tartrates. Sure. Uh, well, that's really cool. Um, the, we enjoyed a bottle of sparkling Traminette the other day. Oh yes. I really liked that. Was that Thanks. done in a traditional method or did that start as a pet nat? So that's champagne method. Okay. Um, but we... We were trying to limit the the classic like yeasty champagne flavors. So yep. um, that one we we brought that fruit in. That's a 2019. Um, we were able to vintage date that bottle. Great. Um, so we brought that fruit in in October, and um, it was in the bottle before the end of the de- end of December. Yeah. And, and those bottles were flipped over to limit yeast contact by April. So we we really tried to push it more in that Prosecco direction yep. um, where it's cleaner and, and just more fruit forward. It's really tasty. Thanks. Um, the, uh, the other projects that you do that are off the beaten path. So you make an orange wine, you said a few, a few. Okay. A few. <laughs> um, so we started making orange wine in, in 2014 and we started with Chardonnay because if you're going to do, uh, uh, a white wine with red wine protocols you check most of those boxes with chardonnay anyways it's yeah. it's kind of a low risk maneuver there um and, and we've actually done that a few vintages now we've done riesling uh gewurztraminer we did uh valve muscat in 18 that had to be awesome oh that's flower bomb yeah yeah it's, it's when i work with valve muscat i always do at least a 24-hour cold soak to pull out like this almost orange marmalade type character, or orange flower, uh, I can imagine what a skin ferment would be like. It's so much more herbal than I expect. Like, like it really pushed in in like a sweet fennel hmm. direction that that's fascinating and polarizing. Interesting. Um, but we we just did in twenty uh, uh, whole cluster spontaneous ferment traminet that I actually have some for you today oh cool good, and we good. left that one unfiltered unfined it's still hazy but nice it's uh i don't know so philosophically i've, I've done orange wines over the years uh, this broad category of orange wines um and one that i'm still really excited about is from the 17 vintage i still have it in barrel uh on on lees and i actually took the white wine lees of Save All and dumped them in. So it had wow. even more lees there. So it's been just marinating for quite a long time. But <clears throat> I don't always like the aspect where there's excessive oxygen. So what, what we ended up doing was uh, submerged cap fermentations for those. So I created a device where we just keep the cap below the surface. Uh, and then we also did punch down. I kind of kept track of both of them separately over the years. Uh, they've At this point, they've kind of 
married in a sense. Like they both have very similar profiles. It was more noticeable when it was young. But philosophically, where do you stand on that? Do you, are, do you want there to be a lot of oxygen in that? Do you try and minimize it? Uh, so I think winemakers have a complicated relationship with oxygen. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's about timing and dose. Yeah. So like um, when you're at the stage where you have a cap on that, we're usually trying to, to soak up as much O2 as we can hmm. just to, to soften some of those tannins. Because yeah. when... When you're making these orange wines, you generally have a little bit more acid around than you would in a red wine, yep. and and acid is going to amplify your perception of astringency. So, okay. so we want things to build in a softer direction. So regular pump overs and punch downs and everything else, um, just to to try and soak them up. Um, but as they age, you pull pull back a little bit. Um, Clark in in postmodern winemaking has uh, a quote from from randall graham who is like one of the people who fascinates me in in the wine industry like more than more than most um and, and randall graham compares uh wine's relationship to oxygen to the concept of chi okay whereas like when when you're young and you have lots of chi it's got to be in contact with the world yep. to to vent it um, but as you get older, you have to guard it. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the, the way that we approach oxygen in the winery. It's in the early stages of a, a wine's life. We, we're not afraid to, to let them breathe, yeah. but, but as they hang around, boy, do we get reductive. <laughs> so Randall Graham is another, another one of these like American iconoclasts and the project of his right now that probably most fascinates me is his pursuit of the original American grape. So he's actually in the process of hybridizing vinifera in California to try and find something that in his lifetime, hopefully he finds it, but is perfect for that terroir. Yeah. He's, he's got a lot of projects like that. He's so that I think is tangent to a bigger project that he's doing where he's trying to grow grapes from seed. Interesting. And um, he's trying to develop new clones. So he, he went to Coat Roti and and he took seeds from tank bottoms of Syrah fermentations and he planted those and hmm. he's he's self-pollinating them to make super Syrah. Hmm. Um, but he's also just like chucking seeds in the ground and seeing what comes up. Yeah. Because I, I think that's something that, that people don't realize that like all of the vines that you see they're clones like they're not grown from seed and and if you plant the seeds that come out of a riesling grape what you get is not going to be riesling yeah um so to grow from seed and and use nature as your selector is a really fun idea for finding new drivers of terroir yeah i i love that idea um requires so much patience (laughs) my gosh (laughs) well i've heard people say about him he's He's always living either 20 years before or after his time. Yep. This is a, a comment I brought up with uh, an interviewer recently. You know, our job is to plant the acorns that our grandchildren will have the chance to sit under an oak tree from. Sure. You know, uh, we cannot be thinking so much in the moment or even the next five years or even the next 20 years. That's not what advanced the human race. You know, it it was, how can I make life better for my progeny, for my kids, for my grandkids? Yeah. And, and I think there's, there's like, I think when you see somebody that that's so iconoclastic, like Randall Graham, there's like this internal drive where it's like, he's got these ideas and if he doesn't let them out, it's not going to be good for him. Like, like I think there's, and, and authenticity to to the way that he pursues these projects that I, I, I feel like culturally we're missing a mm-hmm. lot of the time. So that brings me to another thing I kind of wanted to talk to you about, because <clears throat> at that dinner for Steve D. Francesco, we started talking about how much we both love the medium of podcasts. Uh, and in particular, you know, we, we share an affinity for many of the same broad uh, podcasters. Uh, and even 
with that being us, we're on somewhat different sides of what would be considered a, a standard political spectrum, but how that really almost doesn't matter anymore. Um, so let's back up. Why are podcasts important for winemakers? Uh, and then let's talk some details. Um, well, I think, I think ideas are important for winemakers. And I think podcasts are a unique medium because they allow ideas to, to breathe. And, and sometimes they're bad ideas and yep. you find them out there. Um, but I think the nature of the world that we live in where, where information is oversaturated, just to be able to, to have a conversation with some depth mm-hmm. is, is something that's, that's missing. Yeah. Um, if you turn on the television or, or you're, you're, you know, just in passing, it's, that's what social media is. It's all the highlights and, 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 and maybe not the actual depth that's there. And, and I think it's important for us to, to rediscover that. That's, I think what we're missing. I think we, we, we've been conditioned because of the amount of information that's thrown at us every day, um, to look at surface level stuff. Yeah. I think um, if you want to talk about politics, I, I think that manifests itself in the fact that like, if you look at policy uh, on both sides of the aisle from the mainstream, it's the same. Yeah. The rhetoric is what changes. And, and I think sometimes we mistake rhetoric for policy. Um, you know, it's interesting. So I was having this thought, knowing that I wanted to talk to you about these things uh, today. So it is it, almost all the information we're getting from every major news source is so surface level and sort of like crafted into a narrative, right? And I think they do that because they assume people can't take deeper stuff or maybe just, you know, ad revenue wasn't driving stuff that was deeper. So they go shorter and shorter on, on the surface. And we're faced like with this almost opposite problem right which is we've been so forced into kind of a culture where expertise is what is the most important thing like I just think back to my law career like no one in a major city is a general practitioner right you've got this tiny little subset of law and that is multiplied across science and engineering you name it So because we're so focused on hyper expertise, no one develops general knowledge. Yeah. And and I think to to dovetail with that, it creates orthodoxies, right? Where like there is a standard answer for Mm -hmm. every problem and you have to answer it that way to advance. Um, But heterodox thinking is where all of the great ideas come from. So... I think it's it's become a dangerous place to have a bad idea, hmm. right? Like, and, and I think that, that that's why podcasts have value because you can have your bad ideas, yep. you air them out, and maybe you have some good ones along the way. Yeah. And the folks who I particularly like for that, for heterodoxy, aren't just heterodox for the point of being a contrarian. Right. right. So there is a difference between someone who simply says, like, this is our dominant cultural narrative. And I'm just I'm going to stick, you know, Eric Weinstein says this. I'm just going to put a minus sign next to it. And that's what I believe. So the negative automatically. Uh, but to think about things deeper, to have developed skills in your life that are more general in nature. You know, I heard someone say the builder, the grower, the fixer. Right. So these are all general subsets of skills. But you can get by on life in a great way with that subset. Um, to be heterodox is simply to have garnered this sort of intellectual subset and look at the problem at hand and say, that's not the way I think we should be doing things. Yeah. So there's um, there's this really great book that was written in the 1600s called The Book of Five Rings. Mm-hmm. Um, Miyamoto Musashi. He was yeah. a, a samurai. And he lived in a really interesting period for samurai because they were just coming out of the Sengoku period, and, and there was a unified Japan finally. So all of these men who grew up just battling their whole lives now have to find other things to do. Yeah. And um, he kind of went on this track where he became a philosopher poet, and, and he explored Zen Buddhism and, and just really 
tried to broaden his sense of the world and he wrote the book of five rings where if you read it on its surface level it's it's a combat manual for swordsmen Mm -hmm. but if you read it deeper it's it's about expertise and one of the things that he says that i think really resonates with what you just said is uh once you know the way broadly you see it in everything Mm -hmm. so it's more about learning to think about problems rather than grab an answer off the shelf yeah the, and it is the thinking about problems and not just going to, you know, the pre-prescribed fix-it answer that is fed in the media, you know. To me, a lot of this really came home, like, realizing nobody knows anything they're doing. Like, with just contradictory information over the last year. And it wasn't just about COVID-19. It's economic. It, you know, you think... Yes, we needed to make sure we help people during the pandemic, but we've created 40% more fiat currency in the last year than existed in all of our history before that. Yeah, I, and I think I think the the one of the bedrock problems there is that it's become really really disadvantageous to admit that you were wrong. Mm, right? Mm-hmm, exactly. I have kind of a funny theory about this that I'm going to spin here. It's yeah. going to get ridiculous for a second. I think <laughs> for my generation, mm-hmm. Nickelodeon ruined us hmm. with one show. I don't know if you remember, you can't do that on television. Oh, yeah. Right? Yep. And do you remember one of the main premises of that TV show? There was a secret phrase that you could say, and if you did, the sky would open up and it would rain slime on you. <laughs> and that phrase was, I don't know. Uh, interesting. They conditioned a whole generation of kids to be afraid to admit when they didn't know. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's one of the biggest problems we face now. Like, mm. let's let's get the right answers regardless of, of ego. Yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, the, the ability to say that you've changed your mind on something, especially if new facts come to light, like, there's nothing wrong with that. Not and, at all. But if we have a politician of any party change their mind on something, they're a flip flopper. And no, I, I just realized that I'm a human and there's more facts at play and the facts on the ground may have changed. There's a better answer. You know, that applies whether it be to our own lives or to public policy. Um, and there, there are a number of thinkers sort of along this line that I've really loved. Uh, and sometimes it comes from a jock like Joe Rogan, right? Absolutely. Who takes really complicated things and, as he would say, he dumbs it down and makes it understandable. Um, and then you got, like, bankers, uh, former bankers like Chris Arnotti, who travel the countryside sitting in McDonald's documenting what, like, the average person is going through in this country. Um, and, and that sort of brings me to my other point, because we do have a fair number of, like, millennial listeners. Um this is a generation that got caught up everybody having to go to college getting saddled with debt before they realized what i really love to do is have an apprenticeship and work with my hands sure yeah i and it's i don't know what the answer for that is at this point for the millennial generation other than just to to take a chance yeah i mean um it's going to be difficult but yeah. But go for it. Um, and I agree with you. I think I think that it's to, to touch back to, to how we started this this tangent. Um, there's never been a better time to source your own ideas. Hmm. Right. Like and podcasting is a medium and, and YouTube shows and things like that. They've allowed people to express themselves in a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, and they don't have to go through the gatekeepers anymore. So ideas can find their way out and we're learning that maybe sometimes really bad ideas find their way out. Um, but sometimes really good ideas find their way out and and it's, there's never been a better time to make up your own mind. Yeah. So what podcasts do you listen to when you're making wine besides Viticulture, right? (laughs) I do listen to Viticulture. Um, I think you mentioned um, the portal with Eric Weinstein and, and the Joe Rogan experience. And um, 
I, I really love Lex Friedman yeah. because I think, I think, um, the way that he, he interrogates a lot of the same ideas we've been talking about that are abstract beauty, love, things like that. But he interrogates them with an engineer's mentality mm -hmm. and, and he's tenacious about getting answers. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think he's always a, a, a mind opening listen. Um, and sometimes I just need to feel good. Like at Duncan Trussell is always a, a, a good boost to me yep. when, when, uh, I need that. Or, or sometimes I just need to, to listen to a fart joke and, and <laughs> your mom's house with Tom Segura and Christina Pajitsky is what I queue up. So, um, yeah, that's, there's something for everyone. Yeah. Um, and, and it's an interesting place to consume news. Um, I know we were talking about breaking points with crystal ball and Sagar and jetty. Yep. Um, where, where you have both sides of the aisle trying to hash out the ideas in, in a courteous and humane way, instead of yelling at each other, or yelling over each other. It's, yep. it's refreshing. Yeah. So they just recently launched that, uh, they had been with the Hill, uh, had a show called rising. And this is one of those things when we talk about speaking to a need and then gaining traction, granted they had the backing of the hill so they had their air of legitimacy sort of cast on them uh, but they started this as a youtube show and it went from like a hundred daily viewers to millions and i think they really crossed the threshold when they brought andrew yang on yeah um but then they went off and now they're doing their own thing now they're not constrained by any kind of corporate dictum of what they can and cannot talk about right uh, so I, I really like the work that a lot of them do. Kyle was recently on Rogan, who's on a podcast with Crystal. Sure. I listened to uh, The Realignment with Sager and Marshall Kozlov. Um, yeah, there's just this whole ecosystem. That's amazing. And it's not screaming partisans. It's people with ideas who will admit that they were wrong at an earlier point and then look for solutions for the American people. Right. And, and, and I think especially now when when trust in institutions yeah. it is about the lowest i've ever seen it well i think it's warranted phil yeah. i think they've all failed us just about all of them at some point have betrayed the trust and it's you know it's a lot of whether it, it be higher education whether it be corporations whether it be government at almost every level um, we had so a big thinker i really like is christopher lash I don't okay. know if you're familiar with him. Not familiar. So he's an interesting guy. Um, like, there are a couple, I'd say Christopher Lash and Wendell Berry are two guys who I just absolutely love. If you haven't read anything by them, so you guys should read them, right? Uh, totally different writers, though. But Christopher Lash was writing in the 70s, um, diagnosing the narcissism he was seeing in the culture. Uh, he focused on themes of, like, family he grew, he'd grown up a communist he still viewed the world through a marxist lens um he was definitely a man of the left but i think many of the diagnoses that he was making at the time are even more true today like he had this glimmer that we had switched as a culture into being so narcissistic and so driven by what he he had seen as late stage capitalism where it was just straight consumption 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 and keeping up with everyone else, that it was going to be the unraveling of us, you know. And I think we see that in in one part today, right? So the system is kind of eating itself, uh, and as a result, social cohesion is breaking down, you know. So yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I think that reminds me of um, I don't know if you've ever read Chris Hedges, mm. um, but he was a, a longtime writer for the New York Times, and and he's wrote written a bunch of books. Um, but he wrote a book, Empire of Illusion, mm. which is, I think, speaking to a lot of the same ideas that, yeah. that, um, there are false ideals yeah. that, that we're chasing as a culture that, that serve the interests of, of a very few at the, the detriment of, of the many. Yep. And I think not to kind of push this side of the conversation too long, but you know, for one, like we are in agriculture, so we understand certain things about how ecosystems work um, the way people who don't have their hands in ag always do right um, I like to describe 
how almost every year we have an influx of some insect, right? And it feels like it overwhelms us. And in grapes, it, it can be years with really bad Japanese beetles. I've seen it be things as benign as butterflies. Uh, this year, the, the, lots of this region, it was gypsy moth caterpillars, you know. Um, but on a larger scale, there's a, a writer, Turchin, who, who wrote this theory that um, societies tend to start to break down when the battle for elite status becomes too intense, right? And so he is of the mind that there is this overproduction of elites in, in our society right now. That idea being we aren't classified as elite, but we, so many people were sold a promise that if you go to college, you're going to have the, the boat and the house and the house cabin on the lake or the cabin in the mountains. And all of this stuff is your inheritance. And millennials get there and it's not, Right. And Absolutely. then that battle heats up. Um, and, and then finally all this is just sort of coalescing at the same time as everybody has a phone in their hands and social media, the rise with it amidst this sort of rise of elites in Turchin's theory. It just seems like a bad brew. Well, I think it's, it's like to touch back, it's that end stage capitalism thing, right? Like, mm. and, and it's, I think we're in a unique position because in the wine industry, like we've opted out of the rat race, mm. right? Like, but everybody else is still on the hamster wheel for the most part. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not to say, not saying that there aren't places where, where people have opted out of that system, but like, if you're in the wine industry, you're not here to get rich. Yeah. Like you've accepted that, that you've placed a ceiling on, on your wealth, yep. but, but what you're doing is rewarding enough to you that it's worth it. Yep. And I want to see more of that when I look around. Yeah. Like, like I, there is nothing more exciting than human potential. And I feel like our system squanders it hmm. because it breaks people into this mode of, okay, so you get out of college, you get the job, you start building a lifestyle and now you're trapped by it. It's, mm-hmm. it's golden handcuffs. Yeah. And, and maybe we need time to, to stop and, and take a look around. I think it's, I think it's almost criminal the way that we shuffle 18 year olds into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt before their brains are fully developed. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know why that's a good idea. Well, and you spent the previous 18 years telling them that if you are smart, you need that degree. Not that you can pursue other things because that's sort of a second tier status, you know? Um, that's where I think that whole conversation is, is one conversation that needs to change. It, it is you need to find what you are good at first and what you are passionate about second. And you need to pursue that, right? Yeah. But you need the exposure. So getting rid of things like shop class basically prevented an entire generation from realizing like, oh, man, I actually really like working with wood. You yeah. know? Yeah, absolutely. So, it, I mean... I know we aren't going to diagnose all the world's ills, um, but what I just to kind of bring it back to that, and then I want to bring it back to why I'm making a little bit more. Um, the world of podcasts is amazing because we have the chance we spend in the cellars. Like sometimes it can be a lot of lonely work. You're just doing stuff on your own uh, and having the chance to hear these long form conversations from people who really have thought about these issues deeply. And, and I'm not even going to call them experts. Just yeah. people who think about these things is so rewarding. So, well, and I think that that sometimes, like a really good podcast host, can be a Trojan horse for ideas that you would discredit immediately. Mm. So I think, like, there's a lot of times where I'll see an episode of a podcast where it's a show that I listen to regularly, but it's a a guest that I have a preconceived idea about. Oh my goodness, this person is like. I'm not going to agree with anything they say and I don't like what they have to say or whatever. And then at the end of two hours, it's like, Oh, okay. That, that person's actually pretty cool. Yeah. Like you're talking about Michael Malice. huh? Maybe, (laughs) maybe. Yeah. I mean, Michael Malice is a great example of that where he's just this antagonist anarchist and, and 
if if he had his way, there would be no law. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a ridiculous idea. Yeah. But when you hear him articulate the reasons for it, you understand how he came to it, and, and you understand him as a human and respect him, even if you don't respect. Yeah. The the ideas that that he's offering up. Yeah. No, he's a character. I. Uh, he was great on Lex Friedman. <laughs> uh, those two are, are are a match made in heaven. <laughs> Anytime they get together, because Lex is very stoic and and um, Michael Malice is a troll. <laughs> it's just like, and, and he's a a, a light hearted troll. Um, I, I think I think sometimes we we have a tough time uh, finding the boundary between rascal and scoundrel, right? Mm-hmm. Like. Like where where is the border between mischief and malice and, and and it's very easy in a world where you can sit behind the anonymity of a, a keyboard and and say whatever terrible idea co- comes into your mind uh, to to think of people a, as bad actors when they just have bad ideas. Yeah, you're right though. It's why when I interviewed Bob Medill, the very first question was re- related to his idea that. As a person, he recognizes he can be inconvenient, but it is inconvenient people who move that ball forward a lot of times. Now, some of the troll stuff Malice does is just funny, but I also think like goes too far. But people who can make others uncomfortable at times can make them think as well. Absolutely. And, and I think it, it's important to recognize that that a lot of great ideas um are are offensive to people yeah right out of the gate and, and um we need people that that are strong enough in, in their convictions to to push them and not back off and i think that's one of the things that i respect most about bob medill yeah. is that he's pure authenticity okay. like he will let you know exactly how he feels about something and, and he won't pull punches and and we need that more and more in our lives like everybody needs people around who who are willing to do that that's that's a a critical thing that i think sometimes um can make people seem inconvenient but um a lot of times things that are worth pursuing are not convenient either that's right that's right well if you don't mind i wouldn't mind pursuing tasting a couple uh of the the wines you brought (laughs) all right where do you want to start um we can start with uh what i'll let you guide me well we talked about orange wines yeah and and we talked about flaws (laughs) yep (laughs) so um i have this i hope this is not too unfiltered for you no that's fine okay so this is um we we introduced a new series of wines at montezuma this past year um called our volor series volor is the french word for thief yep and and, um i think that has a a dual meaning for us because a thief is a a tool we use in the winery every day um and i like to steal ideas from (laughs) from winemakers around the world who do things that i find compelling yeah um so we try and put them through our own lens and see what happens these are like these are the art wines. These are, are where we keep our hearts on our sleeves and, and just really do things because they sound like fun and not necessarily because we have an idea of where they're going. Yeah. So I see it's Traminette. Um, I work with a little bit of Traminette, and it is a hybrid of Gewürztraminer. It oftentimes won't have as intense of an oily character or as intense of, uh, you know, people describe it like grandmother's perfume. Sure. But it has a lot of the characteristics I really like about Gewurz, too. So I always have to tell people, I am not a sommelier. I'm a winemaker. I'm probably going to spill the the bottle a little bit when I pour. (laughs) Yeah. It's a weird angle to work at. It is. So, you know, the the wine is definitely unfiltered, um, but it smells brilliantly clean on the nose. Yeah, this was um this was my first spontaneous ferment that was intentional. Hmm. So, um this was sourced from a farm on Sodus Bay. Mm-hmm. Um 
and it was fruit that didn't have a home. And my intention all along was to skin ferment it just to see what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but the week before this came in, my grape elevator broke. Oh. So uh, it became a whole cluster wine <laughs> and I jumped on it like my my boots are in every bottle. Yep. Um, but it, it took forever and it wasn't it wasn't starting to ferment. So we went ahead and and um, I I put some buckets of juice next to, to fermentations that smelled interesting and, yeah. and and let those take off and then inoculated the bins and and it was about twenty days on skins and then some time in neutral barrel with some batonage, but very very low input. I mean, the acidity is bright but balanced considering this is bone dry um and we would expect the acidity to drop a little bit you know the, the potassium of the skins will cause some of that acidity sure to fall uh but it's it's absolutely beautiful phil Thank i you. really like this uh and i admittedly am not someone who always likes orange wines i i really like this thanks man i, I think this one um for me like like this was one where i had to to talk my cellar staff off the cliff because <laughs> when it started to take off, man, it smelled like acetone. Yeah. And, and it was like, guys, just got to trust. We just got to let this one happen. And if it's, if it's not good, we'll figure out what to do with it. But, yep. but we want, we want to see what happens all the time. Um, mm. Was this uh, a similar, so this would be a separate lot of Traminet that went into your sparkling mm -hmm. Traminet, right? So the sparkling Traminet was sourced at, um, uh, we we bought that from Atlas Farms over on Cuca Lake, mm -hmm. which is managed by um, Adam Foltz from Vineyard View Winery. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam's a great guy. Adam's fantastic. Hmm. And Vineyard View is over on Cuca Lake. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I mean that's I I love this. this yeah, is, and, and it's like these are my wines where I'm finding that squishy space between the data. Yeah, right. Like, like we're we're constantly trying to to figure out like what it is about wine that's interesting to us. Do you take a different approach to your sulfur regimen? Um, so this one didn't see any SO two until right before bottling. Okay. And then just a little bit. I think yeah. it landed um, at bottling somewhere around 20 parts free. Hmm. This has been a big change over the years. Really kicked in, in I'd say, 16, 17. Um, but the textbooks will tell you, you, you know, you, let's say Riesling. You ferment Riesling, you bring it in October. Vigorous yeast, it's done by mid-November. You're hitting it with 80 parts yeah. SO2, you know, by the end of November. And um I have just totally stopped doing that. So we do a fair number of uninoculated. It's a mix. Sure. Um, but even in some of my cultured yeast fermentations, they won't see. F I've waited till April, May, June before they see a little bit of sulfur. And that's, you know, because we're going to be getting ready for bottling. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much how we treat reds. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're really minimal mm. SO2 there. Um until they've spent some time in barrel and they've been racked and returned and and, yep. and beat up um but but with whites we we you a little bit more traditional mm -hmm. um but but definitely less heavy-handed than than we used to be and and less micromanaged yep um i think there's just so much that can still come to life and show from a wine in some of those delayed so2 additions uh obviously it it's always a fine line and Years like eighteen, you don't always wait that long. So. No, no, and I think there's there's new tools that that are coming out every day. So like, there's three ingredients in this wine: grapes, chitazan, mm -hmm. and and SO two. And and chitazan is a product that you can add to juice or wine that scavenges some of the less favorable yeasts and bacteria out of them and, and inactivates them so they don't take over a fermentation. I haven't worked with that, but is that the extract from like an algae or something? Or is that the... I, so, so that one, um, it is fungally derived, but okay. but a lot of the... Um, so home winemakers use a lot of chitazan as like a, a clearing agent. So mm. it's 
Um, you buy these packets, they're super clear KC. One okay. one side yeah, is Kytosan and the other sa- side is liquid silica. Okay. Um, and, and that Kytosan is shellfish derived. So that's not really something that we want to get into yeah. because of, of allergies. Yep. Um, but the fungally derived stuff is, is readily available. And I think it's really interesting, particularly for aromatic varieties. If we've got some fruit that we want to do a cold soak or whatever, um, the SO2 that we're adding doesn't necessarily allow us to, to macro oxygenate those in the way we want. So mm-hmm. things like gewürztraminer, where you've got this big phenolic backbone that comes out of the cold soak, yeah. um, if you can beat that must up a little bit and oxidize some of those phenolics off, it makes for, for what I think is more harmonious wine in the end. Hmm. Um, but if you stomp on them with SO2 right out of the gate, you're limiting your ability to, to, to make that happen. Yeah. Um, so that's something that we've been playing with a little bit year after year um, just to see if we can make wines that are texturally um, better by by introducing more oxygen up front hmm that's interesting yeah i'm gonna read up a little more on that i'm not surprised like i brought this up before but um so home gardeners have the chance to actually teach professional farmers especially if they're practicing lots of different uh, crops some things and home winemakers like because it's on such a small scale like have to have a different set of tools than we have available to us. Sure, and and, and I think Kaidazan in, in their context is is for a totally different purpose. Mm. Um, when when you're mixing that with with liquid silica, they have offsetting charges. Mm-hmm. So it's basically forming a net that drags everything out of the wine. So if you don't have a filter, that's your move. It's a good way to do um, it. But it's something where where like every now and again somebody comes up with a tool that like you can scale up. Yeah. And see what happens. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I really enjoyed that. Um, Thanks. That's the skin fermented traminette. So I don't know if you got a chance to look at the back label, but um, we wanted to do something different than what you would see in, on a typical wine label where it's this boilerplate like yeah. smells like this, tastes like this, pair with this. Yep. Um, again, speaking to the idea that... Um, it's it's all of the stuff that we can't articulate yeah. that makes wine fun. Um, so it says experience, and it says uh, for music, Lazy Eye by Aesop Rock, book, reading the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, man. And uh, movie Dogma. So. Yeah. Well, and I think uh, all of this, like there were thematic elements to every wine on this series, and and, and I think... All that art is, and these are our artsiest wines, all the art is is somebody's trying to concretize an abstract idea. Yeah. A- and with each of these wines, I think there were abstract ideas that that our team had when we were making them. Yep. That that it was cool to pull art from other places that I feel like had the same ideas yeah. and tried to, to flesh them out. That's pretty awesome. I love that. I mean, one of the things we talk about is living a good life and living a good life is understanding that wine goes with your friends around you, food, wine, art, music, literature. Um, that's a, that's a nice touch. Thanks. <laughs> and, and we have a, a really, really great um, designer who runs our social media and, and, and all of our, our labeling and, and things like that, Olivia, and she did a great job with these labels. Yeah, so, I think so too. Um, um, other thing I noticed that I realized we didn't talk about is you've got a beautiful picture of a bird, um, which is appropriate because Montezuma is uh, named after the wildlife reserve, which is right there. Sure. So this was, um, like, people have an idea about, who we are at Montezuma because of, of what you see on the liquor store shelf. And and that's, um, by volume represents a lot of what we do. But if you look at like the whole catalog, it's such a small segment. Yeah. And we wanted to do something that was like a bizarro version of that. So 
being right next to the refuge, we, we've got lots of pictures of birds on our uh, labels. And when we were hatching this idea, we were thinking of like, okay, so what's a bird that, that fits this theme of a thief? A- and it's a crow, right? Yeah. Crows steal. They're clever. Yep. They're just like, like this, this is the bird that, that like maybe has a little bit of a weird reputation, but, but is so admirable yeah. when you really get into to what it does. Yep. Um, so all of the, the Volor labels feature a crow holding a thief. Interesting. Um, it kind of just bringing back to birds, one of the most, like, just really cool things to see when you're driving on 5 and 20, at least from Geneva over to the winery, is are they, the osprey nests on top of the telephone lines. Just sure. these massive nests. And in the right time of year, you can actually see some of the baby osprey heads popping up as you know their mother returns to the nest. It's a sight to see. And sometimes when those nests get big enough, the bald eagles come in and fight them for them. Oh my goodness. So there's, if you, um, if you drive past the winery and past the, if you're headed east from Geneva on five and 20, you drive past the winery and then you drive past the refuge and there's a little bridge that goes over the canal. Mm -hmm. And if you take a right turn right after that bridge, you're on the canal there and there's a lock. And on the other side of the lock is is a nest that the bald eagles have stolen. (laughs) So if you go over there, you can see the bald eagles babies poking up out of there. And wow. Yeah. Montezuma refuge is actually one of uh, two sites where they brought, um, bald eagles back from the endangered species list. Like that was where that program started. It, and it's been really successful. Not only do I see them now flying over the winery, you know, all the way down on Seneca Lake, I've seen, I've seen them, I'm driving down five and 20 and they're literally, you look up through the moon roof, just right over your car following the, the highway. Absolutely. They're, they are all over the place yeah. and they're, they're so much fun to watch. I'm so happy that program has been successful. Absolutely. You know? Um, did you want to taste something else? I am happy to taste <laughs> something else. So, um, why don't we get into a red for a second? Yeah. And then I have one dessert wine I want to pour for you at the end. Okay, that sounds perfect. So what are we looking at? So this is Velour Cab Franc. Okay. Um, so this is sourced from Sotus, and most of the the f- fruit in this is from a vineyard that doesn't exist anymore. Mm. So 19 was a vintage where we felt like, you know, this farm was coming offline and we wanted to show everything that we could do there. Yeah. It was that was the first place where we source grapes where where they basically let me have my run of the farm and and make suggestions and decide when we were picking and and they were very responsive to that so i felt like that's kind of where i grew up and and it really hurt to see it go yeah so um what, I, th- this wasn't white pine was it no they're still growing fruit right i believe so yeah um but i just like like i wanted all of these wines to be both beautiful and heartbreaking at the same time. Yeah. So did you cluster thin, drop fruit? Um, what was done differently? So it's it's tough up there to to cluster thin and drop fruit because There's then no. the vegetative growth takes <laughs> over and it's it's tough to to find balance. Yeah. Um, but I think with these with the the cab franc, I just tried to stay out of the way. Yeah and and let it become what i thought it could become it's i I think probably the closest approximation we've ever made to a loire style oh nice so i'll let you oh or i can pour it either way phil reaching over that's okay give a quick rinse (laughs) that traminette's powerful yeah it is yeah i'll pour it it's a little easier for you thank you I usually struggle on the show when we do taste wines. I'm like, ah. <laughs> it happens. Well, I mean, I can tell you, even before it started to get poured, I could smell it from here. It's incredibly aromatic. Deep, rich with kind of a chewy texture on the nose. Um, I was talking about this with Bob the other day, and some of our 
are more difficult vintages, you find a little less fruit, but you find this chewiness that I tend to associate with some of the the broader styles from the Loire. Yeah, and I think there's like mm. there's a green element here too, but it's it's more of that herbal yeah. green than the the green pepper that we've tried to chase out. No, it's definitely not pyrazine driven, but it is uh, it, it is almost more roasted bell pepper than mm-hmm. fresh bell pepper. In a way that uh, is making me hungry. I hear that. Mm. That is awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah. I think that's my favorite Cab Franc we've ever made. Really well-balanced tannins. It's grippy, but it doesn't dry out your palate. Hitting with all sorts of like really ripe boysenberry. Um, oh, man, it's really nice. There's almost Thank this you. like beet juice to it as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that we saw pretty consistently from that farm. There was this like earthy beet thing Yeah. that, that like... Three or four days into fer- fermentation, you could smell it in the bins. Man, I really like that. And it's also part of the Velour series. It is. Yeah, that is that is delicious. And this is currently for sale at the winery? Yep. You mind me asking what that bottle sells for? I think nineteen ninety nine. Oh, that is a steal. Yeah. <laughs> An absolute, and you ship that one too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that is uh, a really nice Cap Franc. Thanks, man. I, I like it's it's heartbreaking that the that the vines are gone, but yeah. but I feel like we we gave them a good send off. I'd say so. Well, nice work, man. Thank you. We can't make red wine around here, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, tasted a bunch of Cab Francs yesterday, uh, and have been revisiting ours because we uh we keep a pretty good library at the winery and so you know we're in this weird phase where we're changing labels because we're changing brands right and so uh, i hadn't released our 18 cab franc yet um and wasn't about to order the old labels so we dug into the library to start releasing some older stuff and released our 12 cab franc pulled out some 14 as well and i mean Cab Franc from the Finger Lakes, to me, tastes like some of my favorite older Bordeaux. You know, with it's moderate alcohol. At, at 12, you know, t- well, close to 10 years in bottle, we're starting to get really nice forest floor notes that plays great with the herbal nature. Um, it's almost like it was bottled dry, but it's like developing a generousness that tastes a little bit like sweetness. Um the only crime about Finger Lakes Reds is we drink them too young. Yeah. I, I think I think like what you're saying there too um is an important point about cool climate reds that that I think gets lost in this conversation a lot. Mm-hmm. Um because there there are no hammers hmm. in these wines, like you can taste the forest floor. You can taste the 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 non fruit elements that that I think most of us who who drink lots of old world wines are, are really excited about. Yeah. Um, I think you lose a lot of that in warm climates, and it's just because the the amplitude of everything else that you have going on there um, just runs it over, um, yeah. and and it shines through. I think in a more balanced way in, in the wines from this part of the world. Yeah. Well, I agree. Well, let's try that uh, dessert try wine. That dessert. All right, I'm not going to tell you what this one is. All right, do, until you <clears> taste it. Do I need to rinse the glass, or <sighs> those are going to be pretty dominant? It's fortified. Okay. It's a strong variety too. Okay. Well, an in interesting color. So. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had a pink port? Uh, no, no, I haven't. There we go. Today's a first. So I make a Vinda Naturale from Muscat and Chardonnay and Riesling. Although we've only ever released um, the Muscat and a small uh, Riesling. And then just one from Red. So, If you look at the back label, it'll tell you what's in it. So, All right. 
So we've got a Catawba. That's a bold move bringing me some Catawba there, Phil. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, though. And this is, uh, <clears throat> you fortify during fermentation? Sure. So we, we fermented it about five days on the skins. Um, and then we, we pulled it to a tank and, and fortified it when it coasted into the, the, the right residual sugar level that we thought um, it needed to be. And uh, aged in, in, in American oak for, for a few months. And then we pulled half of it out and bottled it. The mm-hmm. other half is going to form the heart of, of a Solera. Okay, cool. So um, I had this grand idea that, that the year to start a Solera was 2020, hindsight being what it is. <laughs> uh, it, what I love about this, too, is we are really taking it back to um, connecting with the history of what we're doing in this region. Yeah. You and, know. And I think that's you spoke earlier about the torch passing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of it is that as the old guard kind of retires and, and moves out of, of the sellers every day, um, we see like this younger generation coming up is rediscovering a lot of the things that were kind of the pivotal varieties and styles that they worked with early in their careers. Yeah. We're just putting new spin on it. Well, you know, so it is clearly Catawba aromatically, um, but there is something different about it. Uh, For one, it's, it's not as pungent, I guess I can say it's not as offensive. It's, but it's juicy. uh, It's attractive. It is, uh, it's nostalgic. Well, and Catawba is shockingly floral. Yeah. It's got some deeper tones, and that may be the alcohol, um, but it it actually, I mean, it really helps the wine. So the alcohol that we used, and we have a distillery on site, so mm-hmm. we, we're able to, to do some really fun stuff with, with these. Hmm. Uh, this is Concord vodka. So it's Concord and Catawba. I love it. I love it. You know, that's really tasty. Um, so my wife, uh, you know, being from France, when we go a lot of times, I think as Americans, we would classify this as dessert wine. But this is what you would oftentimes like. I could picture people loving to serve this as an aperitif because it's this idea that that little bit of sugar, that little bit of alcohol, like primes the gastric juices, sure. gets them pumping, really gets you ready for a meal. Um, and I would be, I, I would personally be more than happy to serve this, especially as like people come over and maybe even in a little bit of sparkling. Yeah. And this is like, like, this is what we were talking about before is I, I want to dust off some of these old varieties and see, yeah see what kind of treads left on the tires because they're around and, yep. and they're like, if you look at, at it purely from an economic standpoint, like if you're going to take a chance, take a chance with something that's three four hundred bucks a ton right yeah. like like but in the right year you can get free <laughs> yeah yeah like i don't know it's 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 low risk yeah and, and it can be really rewarding and, and i think that like we're seeing the cool kids kind of come around to hybrids and natives there's mm. there's articles coming out about them every few weeks and yeah. and, and maybe this is a way that we tie history to to future yeah well from a sustainable perspective these grapes require so much less by way of vineyard input sure including just getting the tractor out there which means we're not compacting the soil which is keeping the soil healthier uh so i mean it makes sense i've never been someone who's opposed at all to hybrids yeah i think it's um they just haven't had their chance to shine yet yeah uh and you're you're singing my musical tune here the calf ronk needs to be paired with some wilco yeah way to go there and father john misty on the uh Catawba. yeah i think uh father john misty is one of the best songwriters that nobody really knows about well, i mean people know about him but but uh pure comedy might be the greatest lyrics ever written yeah. as far as i'm concerned yep and paired with some good books too 
Yeah, I mean, this Huxley's is... Huxley's Island on the, the Cab Franc and Art of Motorcycle, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance for the Catawba. Yeah, and I think that, like, again, thematically, like, so this dessert wine, we had to give it a fanciful name. Yeah. Uh, we call it O Tropicero. Okay. Which is Portuguese for the trickster. Okay. <laughs> um, traditionally, crows are, are tricksters in, yep. in native mythologies. Um, and, and I think it was tricky to, to use these varieties to, to produce this style. So yeah. it fit. Um, but there's this idea, like, thematically, I think all of these things make sense. Yeah. Like, um, if you look at it, this one, you've got that Father John Misty song, I'm writing a novel, right? Which yep. is, is just like this. The whole idea is like I'm writing a novel because it's never been done before, yeah. right? Yeah. Like people have made Concord and Catawba forever. People yep. have made fortified wine forever. Like this is nothing new. Yeah. This is just a different way to put them together. Yeah. Um, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, again, the metaphysics of, of quality. Yeah. Um, and, and this idea that like there's something that I see in Catawba that needs exploration. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know if you've ever seen Be Kind Rewind, the movie. It's I a, haven't. It's, uh, you know, Michelle Gondry, the the guy who made Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless oh, yeah, definitely, Mind. Definitely. So he made this movie with Jack Black and Most Def. Yep. Um, where they work at a, a video store, like a VHS video store in New Jersey. And this is in like the mid 2000s. So okay. videos are not, <laughs> yeah. not hanging around. <laughs> and then through this terrible event, all of the videos get erased. <laughs> okay. So they start remaking the movies themselves. <laughs> and, and they build this cult following that that's that like unites their whole neighborhood that's under gentrification and yeah. and brings everybody together. So it's this idea of like let's spruce up this old thing our own way. Yep. Well, and as a an avid fan of Bill Murray and Owen Wilson, and kind of the entire suite of those films, uh, the Life Aquatic for the uh, the Cav Franc. So that's yeah, Wes Anderson. He's like he's amazing, uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah, and and I think again, it speaks to like sometimes to get it right, you have to lose the things you care about. Like, yeah. like that's that's Bill Murray's journey in that movie is that like he's chasing the jaguar shark the whole time but he loses his best friend he loses his son he loses his self-image yeah in that pursuit and 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 i think that that's how i felt about this farm Mm -hmm. going away is like finally we get it right yeah and it's gone i was uh as you were saying that i was popping in my head that same feeling when luke wilson is looking in the mirror in royal tenenbaums feels like his life's fallen apart and Elliot Smith comes on with Needle in the Hay. I mean, that was a potent scene, and that's probably how I would have felt seeing this vineyard go. Yeah, and it, it was like, this is finally when we're going to get it right? Because mm-hmm. this is something where I experimented for years. Like, we did a lot of whole cluster trials, and we did a lot of just, like, sh- putting this in, in several different directions, and finally it was just like, let's see what happens. Yeah, Let's just let it do its thing. Well, I've really enjoyed this, Phil. Me too. Do you have any final words you'd like to share? I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I've been rolling the whole time. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I just, I, I think that, that like, the, the take-home message from today's conversation is to, to be open-minded, be flexible. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what we need right now is we need... We need people that are willing to uh, explore ideas and and not be afraid of them at the outset. And we need um, we need that in winemaking as much as we need it culturally. Yeah. Um, and and that's what I'm trying to be. So it's good to find like minded people to talk about that with. <laughs> well, I agree, and we're going to be doing this again. So. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, thanks, Phil. I'm going to close this thanks, out. Thanks, man. This has been Phil Plummer, uh, winemaker at Montezuma. He truly is forging his own path. He's thinking for himself, and he's making the Finger Lakes winemaking community a little better for it. Thanks, and see you soon. I hope you enjoyed this show. This has been Viticulture, where we share ways to cultivate a good life. Don't forget to visit our website at viticulturepodcast.com. Subscribe to our Substack, where you'll get show notes, transcripts, musings, and exclusive offers, 
and check us out on all the major social media platforms. Thanks again for stopping by.